Hebrews chapter 10. I'm going to begin reading here at verse number 11, and y'all pray much for me when I need to stop. Um, I, this whole chapter speaks to my heart this morning here. Hebrews chapter 11 here, beginning at verse, Hebrews chapter 10, I'm sorry, beginning here at verse number 11. The text says this from the New King James translation of the Bible. And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifice, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. From that time, from that time, waiting till his enemies were made his footstool. For by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. But the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us. For after he had said this before, after he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their hearts and in their minds I will write them. Then he added, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Nowhere, no, now, now where there is uh, remission of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter into the holiest of the blood of Jesus by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart, full of assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled with, e with an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering and for he who has promised is faithful and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works uh, not forsaking the assembling of one of of other of ourselves together as is the manner of some uh, but exalting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. I want to use this tagline here this morning, who's got your mind? And, and, and uh, probably a sub-thought there, Walker, evidence of a change. Yeah, yeah, evidence of a change. Amen, amen. The grass withereth and the flower fadeth. But the word of our God shall stand forever. Yeah. You ever wonder, wonder how you know you've really been changed? Do you ever stop and really assess the transformation of your spirit man in your life? Do you ever pause and take an internal assessment as to whether or not um, you still walking on the street of righteousness. Do, do you ever get into a space where your own behavior causes you to say, ooh, would God be pleased with that? Does life ever arrest your mind and cause you to think about the life that you're living? Are you on that path of righteousness? Has the washing of the blood of Jesus Christ truly set you free? Paul is trying to get these Jewish believers to understand that they can't work their way into eternal life. He's trying to get them to think about what they spend their time doing. He's trying to get them to embrace where their thoughts are, what's in their mindset, what their level of understanding is about the Holy Spirit. He's trying to get them to be just a bit reflective on what's good and what's best. You see, it's good to know the priest. It's good to know that the priest can, can work on your sins. But you need to also know it's best 
They have a priest, a high priest that can wash your sins away forever. It's good to know some things. It's good. It's good to be able to pause and think on the goodness of God. But it's even better to know that whatever God has for you, it's for you. Whatever pathway God ordains in your life, that's the pathway he has ordained. It's best to know whether I'm abound or abased. I'm still with the Lord. You ever take time to assess the level of sin in your life? I mean, honestly. Does your mouth overweigh sometimes? Does your, does your, does your attitude transition your spirit man at times? Is it all put to bed? Has the, has the, has the embrace of the washing of the God's word allowed your sins to be truly thrown into a sea of forgiveness? One writer argues that uh, oftentimes we deal with symptoms more so than fixing the problem. For example, a psychiatrist uh, can assess your psychiatric problem. He can't fix the problem, though. He'll diagnose you as bipolar. He'll diagnose you as, as depressed. He'll diagnose you as all of those things. But the truth of the matter is he can't bring closure to that problem. When Jesus diagnosed you as a sinner, one saved by grace, he brought complete closure to your sin life. And that wasn't any going back. The Bible says it. If you didn't throw that page out, I just read it. He says, you no longer have an offering of sin. And the problem is in this day and time, in this particular passage of text, these believers were under the impression that what they did through the high priest was all right. It's right there in the text in verse number two in that same chapter. He says, for then they would not have um, cause to be offered. For the worshiper once um, purified would have had no more consciousness of sins. In, in other words, that the priest could help you wash, but your sins were not completely washed away. There are folks that get washed week after week. But for some strange reason or another, on Monday, the washing doesn't hold. For some strange reason or another, their minds are still cluttered with worldly thoughts, selfish ambitions, my many God ideologies. They're still caught up in a mindset that doesn't belong to God but belongs to man. But they were in church Sunday. Why did they sung praises of songs to God? They prayed prayers with God. But for some strange reason or another, the washing didn't take hold. Let me see if I can get to my points here today. My first thought is that the Christ-like consciousness has to be triggered by the word in your heart. It, it has to be triggered by the very word in your heart. Notice in verse 14, he says, for by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. But the Holy Spirit also witnesses to. I, I, I shared I shared earlier this week on two separate occasions that oftentimes the reason we're not able to truly assess where we are with our sin nature is because we don't have a witness that's speaking enough to the sin that's in our life. The, the, the believer has to realize that they have been forgiven of sin, sins yesterday, sins today, and sins tomorrow. But in that forgiveness, there's a process of continuing to work out that faith. Just because God gives you that get out of jail free card doesn't give you just the opportunity to keep on sinning and just turn around and keep on saying, Lord, forgive me because you know me. He does know you. He knows where your shortcomings are. He knows where your faults and your failures are. And because the Holy Spirit does not witness unto you, you know also. 
So wait a minute. How does the Holy Spirit witness? The Holy Spirit witnesses by making sure that you have what's called, Paul told the church in Galatians, the fruit of the Spirit. In Galatians 5 and 22, he says there are some elements of the Holy Spirit's witness that ought to show up in your, in your faith walk. And, and, and I, 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 used to, I used to try to tear them apart. I used to say, okay, Lord, I can have some self-control. But, but then he turned around, you need to have joy also. I, he, I, I said, Lord, I, I, I can tear them apart. I can have love. But he said, no, you got to have, have meekness also. He says, you've got to have all of those elements of the fruit of the Spirit, not just one aspect of it, but all of them at the same time. That's, that's why we have to keep praying. That's why we have to have the word, not just on our lips, but in our heart. Romans 6 and 11 says, Likewise reckon ye also yourselves be, uh, be dead indeed into sin, but also alive unto God through Jesus Christ. He told the church of Philippi, he says, I can do all things through Christ Jesus. Not a matter of, of the fact that I can do things because of Jesus. I do all things because it's through Jesus. In other words, if Jesus makes the way, it'll get done. If Jesus doesn't make the way, it won't get done. If Jesus calms my spirit, my spirit will become. If Jesus doesn't calm it, it won't become. It all has to be done through Jesus. So when we talk about this word in our heart, the word can't just be there for a moment in time. The word just can't be there for a particular season. The word has to be continuously cleansing, continuously washing, continuously making us better, and continuously getting us where we need to be. A few years back, Sister Cheeks and I purchased a new washing machine, and, and um, Bro Wells, that washing machine has, has some unique aspects to it. it it has it has a button on it that's that's called um uh self-clean yeah self-clean and and what you're supposed to do is go and purchase this uh tablet to put on the inside of it and you turn it to the self-clean feature and push the button and then it cleanses itself and I said, yeah, that's good. That's fine and dandy. And a few weeks back, we started getting some strange aroma coming out of the washing machine that wasn't so pleasant. And we said, we may need to get that button, to, that, that piece to put in there to get it clean. And we did. And I, I got the box. And I uh, strangely began to read the instructions on the box. And I was just blown away when I read the instructions. It said, you should do this monthly. <laughs> and, and, and we've been washing for three years. We've we been, we been walking around thinking we clean for three years. We've we been walking around thinking we got fresh clothes on for three years. And we've been walking around sniffing ourselves for three years, thinking everything is all right. And, and come to find out, we didn't read the instructions to know that we still dirty. That, that, that's what happens to us. I, I, I took the chair. I'm all right. I got baptized. I'm, I'm all right. I, I go to church. I'm, I'm all right. Not reading, not reading the instructions, realizing that every day you got to crucify that flesh. Every day you need to give God glory. My, my second argument is that not only must you have the word in your heart, but, but, but Paul makes the case that there has to be a level of wisdom in your mind in this text. It has to be some wisdom in your mind because keep in mind, these folks were under the impression that in verse 11 it says that every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifice which can never take away your sins. They were under the impression just by virtue of the priest offering their sacrifice every day, it was all right. And, and that ain't no wisdom. Ain't, ain't nothing wise about partially being right with God. There's nothing wise about being somewhat in right nature with God. There's nothing wise about partially knowing who God is and, and saying I partially understand which direction. There, there's nothing wise about, listen, having your stuff together, but then being mindless about those that don't have their stuff together. There's nothing wise about being able to move out of where you've come from and then look back at those that are stuck there and say, oh, they got to figure out for them themselves. There, there's nothing wise about that. Hebrews 11 and 1 says that now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. In just a few words, listen, the text is trying to tease out what we need to understand is the fullness of our faith. We got faith down packed most of the time when it comes to us. 
But do we ever realize that God has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light so that we can be disciples of Jesus Christ? That's a responsibility we have in order to draw men unto Christ so that they will know who we are and they will know who our God is. And, and here's the beautiful part about it. The only way we draw men unto Christ is we got to stop talking about the Bible and it turn out learn how to be the Bible. We, we need to figure out how, and that's, that's what these folks need to have, have. They had to understand that it wasn't a matter of not just understanding the role of the priest. It was more so a desire and an interest to understand that the priest is all right, but Jesus is much better. It's all right to know that you, you got the religious aspects down packed. It's, it's all right to know that your preferences might be different from my preferences. It's all right to know that stuff, but at the end of the day, if we don't have Jesus as our guide, we don't have Jesus as the author and finisher of our faith. If we don't have Jesus as the one that's instructing the Holy Spirit to be a witness unto us, if we don't have Jesus as the one that allows the law to be that schoolmaster for us and, and his Holy Spirit to be the really working of the, the flesh of God, if we don't have Jesus there, then we've missed the boat. Because notice, 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 Jesus says here, he says in verse 18, he says, now there is a, now, now, no, no, now where there is remission of these, <laughs> there is no longer an offering of sin. I pause at that word remission because I was trying to understand why would Paul use the word remission here? Remission, remission doesn't sound right. Remission doesn't seem like it goes there. But then when you really dig into the fact, his latter part, he says it's no longer an offering. In other words, Jesus cancels your sin. Amen. Who keeps paying a bill where it's been paid off? That's foolish. Who, 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 keeps calling, who keeps calling Jim's AC asking why my bill not coming in the mail and the car is paid off? Who keeps, who keeps giving the hospital money for paying off your medical bills, but the bills have been paid off? And, and, and too often we find ourselves walking in this sinful mindset, paying debt on stuff that God has already paid off. We're still worried about what folks are going to say about us and what folks think about us and what our, what our shortcomings and faults and failures have been. Did we not read the word where he says that all men had fallen short of the glory of God? We've all sinned, my brothers and sisters. And in the fact that we've all sinned, we all need the remission of our sins. We've all got our sins canceled and we've all got our sins pushed into a sea of forgiveness is what the word of God says. And, and because it's been placed into a sea of forgiveness, we understand that we have access to Jesus Christ through the very blood of, of our Savior. Listen, my brothers and sisters, as long as we've got confidence in the blood of Jesus Christ, we've got all the opportunity that we need to get this thing right. As long as we understand that the high priest has gone as far as he needs to go to do all that he needs to do in our lives. He's already torn down the curtain that was between us and God. The Holy Spirit himself is now available to us. The Holy Spirit walks with us and talks with us. The Holy Spirit guides us and directs us. The Holy Spirit will answer any question that you have for God. Yeah, yeah, and I'm, I'm so glad that God didn't just partially do that thing. <laughs> God did it and then sat down. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you, you, ever, you, ever been, you ever been doing some work and then when you finish the work, you just go somewhere and sit down? <laughs> you, you only sit down, Brother Marshall, when you know it is finished and, and final and, and there's nothing else to be done. And y'all say, well, wait a minute, God didn't do that. He's right there in the text. <laughs> the text says, but the man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, he sat down <laughs> at the right hand of God. <laughs> and listen, I'm so glad that he didn't just sit down anywhere. <laughs> God could have chosen a new planet to go and sit down on. <laughs> he could have found the moon where nobody was going to bother him to sit down on. <laughs> he could have found a a couple of churches that were loving him partially right and sat down with them but the bible says that he sat down next to god in other words god knew that his work was done god approved his work being done god finalized his work on sin because he let him sit down next to his father but we keep we keep resurrecting sin we keep resurrecting issues we keep 
picking back up the problems, not realizing that our sins have been sprinkled away from our heart. They've been washed away from our bodies. And listen, when stuff has been washed away from your heart, you don't have any more guilt with it. When it's been washed away from your body, you don't keep walking in those same mindsets, in those same veins. You are set free. And one writer said that you're free indeed. But we don't let our mind get changed. We keep holding on to the mindset of yesterday. God giving us brand new mercies each and every day, and we keep running back to yesterday. He gives us new opportunities every day, and we keep turning around, smiling at what we did three weeks ago. Smiling at what we did when we were 15 and 20. We keep turning around looking at those things that are long beyond and past us when we need to be reaching forth unto those brand new mercies, those new opportunities and times that God has given unto us. We, we've got to reach into the goodness of God that's in the future where we're going with him. But too often we find ourselves trying to save ourselves. We become lovers of ourselves. We heaping itching ears to our own understanding. We've got our own doctrine that we operate by. And it's, it's blasphemous, my brothers and sisters. It's blasphemous because we think we can do it. <laughs> when he's already done it. <laughs> we think we can do what God has already done. And, and here's, here's the thing about it. Oftentimes, it's our conversation that gets us into trouble. My final thought here is, is trying to get us to understand this New Testament church because the New Testament church in Acts reminded us that not only did they come together because of the Holy Spirit, but I love how they came together. <laughs> the Bible says they came together breaking bread, <laughs> singing songs, <laughs> and having prayers with one another <laughs> in the same place. <laughs> In other words, they were unified around the word of God. And as a result of it, the text says they were added to every day that they came together. And we wonder why sometimes the world seems to be growing, but the church does not seem to be growing. Because we refuse to get unified. We refuse to see the interconnection between our ministry works. We refuse to see the, the working of, of encouraging and supporting and lifting up one another. We refuse to individually get right so that we collectively can be right with God. Yeah, and, and when I say we ain't talking about in the light, I'm talking about church universal because we got as many folks as that, that will, because you ain't Baptist like me, I don't fool with you. Because you're not non-denominational about me, I don't fool with you. As a matter of fact, our ice is colder than your ice over there. Our water is wetter than your water over there. And as a result of it, I'm greater. I know more. I understand better. And we miss that thing because at the end of the day, he says all men will be judged everybody's going to have to go by that same moment huh, of answering who are you huh? and I hope and pray he doesn't look down huh, and say depart from me huh? you one that's filled with iniquity huh? I know you not let, let me see if I can get out of here my, my third and final point I, I know it's fifth Sunday I was supposed to be short and nice but my third and final point here is that listen our, our conversion the action our conversation I'm sorry our Actions has to display the very work of God. The, the actions have to display the work of God. No, notice in verse 21, the text says here, he says, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart full of assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from evil conscience and our bodies washed with the pure water. He says, let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering because he, has pro he who is promised is faithful. Uh, you, 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 ever, you ever heard the word fickle? Yeah, yeah. All right. Cardi, you ever, you ever heard the word? Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Uh, fickle says that you 
change frequently. Frequent, fickle says you're not loyal to anything, any interest, any kind of affection. It's the wind is blowing and you change. The rain falls and you change. You're fickle. And, 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 and Paul said these Jewish Christians in this church, they, they had found a way to keep turning back and trying to bring what was yesterday into today. They, the reason that priests were in the conversation is because they wanted to do parts of the things that the priests were telling them and other parts they wanted to put down and, and I, I labeled them as being fickle. Yeah, you're fickle when, when for some strange reason that you love today but you hate tomorrow. You're, you're fickle when you, when you got picks and chooses. You're fickle when, y- y'all ain't gonna pray with me today. You're, you're fickle Fickle when, when, and, and listen, I'm going to say this, I'm fickle when, when, I, when I wake up some mornings feeling good and not realizing that it's still the day that the Lord has made and I ought to be rejoicing in it. Listen, we become fickle when we see other folks having certain things and then we want those things for ourselves. We're fickle when we claim no God, when we need something from God, but for some strange reason or another, when everything is going well, I don't know nothing about about the Lord. We are fickle in that season and time. And Paul says, listen, God don't need you to be fickle because he's already washed away your sin debt. He's already created something new in your life. And then verse 26 says, for if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, then there is no remaining, there is no, there is no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. Listen, he says essentially, when you know better you ought to do better when you understand God you ought to walk with God and listen when you don't do those things listen the very sin that has washed you clean the, the very the very purity of God that has washed you clean you got to go back and revisit that thing listen God says here today you got to see the working of God God has to work in your understanding God has to work in your behaviors God has to work in your weaknesses he has to work in your strength because the truth of the matter is when you don't let God work on it you're working in your own strength and the last time I checked we don't have a heaven or hell to put anybody in we can't save ourselves because the truth of the matter is if we were able to say what you doing over there boy if we were able to save ourselves then we would find ourselves listen not needing Jesus Christ we wouldn't have need the New Testament we wouldn't have need the freedom of the Holy Spirit uh, to show up in our behalf. Uh, But listen, God says uh, he is waiting on us uh, to yield our mind, body, and souls. Uh, These Jewish Christians, uh, they understood partially about the Lord God Almighty, uh, but they didn't know that every day uh, God gives them a new son. Uh, Every day uh, God is working in their situations. Uh, God is working on their faith. Uh, God is trying to get them to fold on uh, unto the very promise that he made. Uh, And y'all want to know what that promise is. The promise is that he's coming back for a church without a spot or wrinkle. And the last time I checked, I hadn't found yet a name of a church. I know sweet water is good, but God ain't coming back for sweet water. I believe true light is all right, but God not coming back for true light. He says he's coming back for a church without a spot or wrinkle. Meaning he's walking around that looking at you, the church that you've got on the inside. God is coming back and he's going to be looking for you. I'm almost, I'm almost done, and, and, and there's some younger folks here with me today that, that right. said, Pastor, I hear you. I, I, I believe I've been washed clean. I, I believe I've been made whole again, but, but I just don't want to do that right now. I, I'm going to wait a little while until I get a little bit older, and then, then, I, then I'll, I'll lean into trusting and serving God. I, I got a newsflash for y'all young folks. Death angels don't care who you are. <laughs> Death angels don't care about your age and your persuasion. Death angels don't care about how long you've been talking to the Lord or how least of time you've been talking. Death angels don't care how big or how small you might be. When they get their orders, the death angels are going to do what they're designed to do. 
And listen, I would hate my brothers and sisters for you to know who God is and the death angels show up one day requiring your service because that's a ticket you have to punch. That's a call you have to answer. Listen, that's a bus stop you have to get on because at that point in time, all is said and done. All is over. You've got to make sure that you get right with God while it is day, while blood, blood is still running warm in your vein, while you can still understand that he is an able God. You've got to understand that God needs you right now. I, I, uh, I, uh, I, uh, I, uh, I'm almost out of here. Um, many of us have televisions in varying places of our homes. I, I personally have them in just about every room of my home. I've got them in the bathroom. I've got them in the kitchen. I've got them in my study. Televisions are everywhere. And the truth of the matter is they are varying sizes. The smaller the screen, the more I have to focus on the images. The larger the screen, the less I have to deal with the details. And, and really what I found out is that uh, the small picture televisions, <laughs> they, they're not really there for me to see the pictures. Sister Yates, it's, it's more so for me to just keep up with the noise. <laughs> it's really just there for me to, to know what's being said. And, and if I really want to see the images, I, I go to a bigger screen. <laughs> Listen, I, I'm convinced that that's what we've done with God. For some strange reason, those Christians don't like to see the big picture. <laughs> they, right. they like to focus in on the narrow stuff. <laughs> and the narrow stuff that sometimes they can't see because they don't have the whole picture. <laughs> but they hear enough <laughs> that causes them to go one direction or another. <laughs> see, I hear enough about the news <laughs> to at least, at least engage in the conversation <laughs> of what happened. <laughs> but if I'm really trying to get a full depth and breadth on what took place in that event. I've got to not only look at the bigger television, but sometimes I've got to do some additional research. i got to dig a little bit deeper in that season to see what it is that might be going on. Listen, I stopped by to remind somebody here today, don't get your religion and your relationship with God caught up in some small images. Make sure that because you got a relationship with God, you have a desire and an interest uh, to see the big picture. Uh, even if you don't know what the elements of the pictures are, uh, you need to trust and believe that God sees it. Uh, and God knows from a bird's eye view. Uh, he knows where you're going. Uh, he knows what you're doing. Uh, and he knows what the end is going to be. Uh, and because you are a believer uh, that's been washed by the blood of Jesus Christ, uh, and you have the full assurance of the faith. It's right there in the text. Uh, you have been, you have your faith uh, that has not only been sprinkled with the word of God, uh, but your consciousness has been washed uh, and you've been washed so much uh, that you've got a living hope. Uh, and because you are there, uh, you know God has the bird's eye view. Uh, God understands where you're going. Uh, he understands what's going on around you. Uh, he understands what the end is going to be. Uh, but you know you got to trust God. Uh, even when you don't understand, you got to trust God. Even when you don't see the end, you got to trust God. Even when all you're doing is listening to his sweet spirit speaking from behind your ear. I am convinced, my brothers and sisters, we've got too many believers that are living in darkness because they won't see God for the bigger picture. They stuck on the little stuff. They stuck on what they can hear a little bit. They stuck on their own feelings and thoughts. But God is a way maker. God is a bridge over troubled waters. God is our everything. Who taught him to do that stuff? I have to work tomorrow. I can't have my voice gone. Uh, who 
who's got your mind? Uh, I'm just joking with Alan. He, he's doing a wonderful job. Who's got your mind? Well, where's, your, where's your focus and attention day by day? Do you stay caught up in what is going on on CNN and society? Or do you trust that God is still in charge? God, God is still orchestrating what seems to be for our bad. God can still use that thing for our good. Here's the thing I've tried to get folks to understand, is that God is sovereign. There's nothing that gets by him. There's no situation that he don't understand. He is sovereign. And, and when we start to operate in the sovereignty of God, we have then some evidence that God is still alive in our lives. See, you don't just show up in a particular place and say, well, oh, well, I'm just here. And it just happened to work out that way. You got to trust that God ordained for you to be in that place. He ordained for you to see what you're seeing. He ordained for you to hear what you're hearing. And the more we embrace that God is in charge of everything and we get away from our own thinking, then we'll be able to understand that it is the goodness of God that leads us from day to day. Just think about his darling son that found himself on a Roman cross, dying and giving up his life, not knowing what his father might do, but trusting and believing that his father would not leave him there. Bible says the sun refused to shine, the moon dripped away in blood, but Jesus stayed right there. The earth rocked and reeled and gave up the, the dead, but the Jesus stayed right there. And the text says he went into an earthly grave that he knew he wouldn't need a long time. And then three days later, he got up again because he trusted his father. Be encouraged, light, to know that God is able to handle all things. He just needs you to make your mind up to stay with him. Make your mind up to let God lead you. Make your mind up to trust God when you can't trace him. Make your mind up to just love those that misuse you. That don't mean you gotta be nobody's doormat. But just be sure that they ain't keeping you away from God. Because the last time I checked, he said his unconditional love. Don't, don't put no conditions on them. You heap coals of fire up on their head by continuing to love them the way like I called you to love them. Be encouraged, like to know that God is still well able to do exceeding and abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think. But we got to be assured that we've been washed by his blood, that our sins have been thrown into a sea of forgetfulness. So if, if God has thrown your sins away, what you worrying about your pastor knowing your sins for? If God has thrown your ill ways and issues away, why are you worried about your neighbor knowing that you used to be out there bad? If God has thrown it away, why are you worried about someone that's got to go through the same pathway that you got to go through? Be encouraged today, like, to have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And in that relationship, you'll have everlasting life. Yeah, God bless you all today. Listen, the doors of the church are open. We want to invite you to come by letters, a candidate for baptism, or by Christian experience. For those of you that are in our virtual service here today, we want to invite you to accept Christ as your Lord and your Savior. We want to invite you to step out on faith. And as you step out on faith, we invite you to let him know that you need him. Listen, if you need our help, we won't mind talking with you by phone or corresponding with you by email. But we want to do our very best to help you get to see the Lord for yourself. We invite you to come. Yeah, yeah. See me, Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Oh, see, Yeah, yeah. Your name, your name. My 
heart will sing. Yeah. What do Oh, how great is our God. See we how great is our God. Oh, see how great. Amen, amen. God bless you all again today. Um, that's all right, that's all right, that's all right, that's all right. God bless you. That's all right. Bless you, bless you, bless you, bless you. We thank God for all that God has said and done here today. Listen, let me uh, encourage you to continue to heed the word of God. Know that God is looking for you. You may be seated. God is looking for you to ensure that your faith walk is right with him. And it don't do no good to shuck and jive me. Oh, y'all thought I don't know those words. I, I'm, I, I like to code shift. Yeah. I, I like to code shift. I can talk with the best of those that are uh, speaking the English language. But I also hadn't forgot I came from Warner Avenue by way of Bloodstack, Mississippi. And, and my, my dad used the word shucking and jiving. And it would go through me like, like, like knives. Because what I thought he didn't knew, no, he knew. And, 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 and we become experts at trying to shuck and jive one another. And we wearing gasoline underclothing and standing on two banana peels, trying to fool somebody else. And God already knows, already knows who we are. And then, then we get mad because folks call us out in our stuff. Because they call out our sin. And we get mad because we in the house where we're supposed to have sin called out. And we're mad because folks call out our sin. Yeah, but we are thankful, thankful for the goodness of God. Um, I, I am immensely grateful uh, for all that God is doing and has done. And uh, I'm, I'm thankful, Pastor Wells, um, I said to you last Sunday, you have to stay near the word. Yes, sir. And I'm a living witness that yes, staying near the word yes, sir. makes a difference. Yes, sir. Yes, staying near the word helped me pray off some stuff that I ain't had nothing to do with. Yeah. Staying near the word has helped faithfulness not only be talked about, but then exemplified. Yes, staying near the word will get you where you need to be faster than you ever thought you could get there. But you gotta stay near God's word. Make it your business every day to spend some time with the Lord. Now, I don't care how long it is, but try to be repetitive in the place, the location, and the time. Talk to God and let him talk to you. And before you know anything, God will have changed your whole mindset. Your likes and your dislikes will be different. The folks you run with won't run with you no more because you won't engage in that kind of conversation. And, and, and the thing about it is, God will get you to the point where you won't tolerate stuff. I, there are certain languages I don't use and and, and when folks get all hot and get to using them language, I, I just get quiet. Amen. And so, Jan, I get quiet because I'm looking for an exit. Because I don't want you infiltrating my mind with that foolishness, making me go back to where I was. And God done got that stuff out of me and it, it didn't get out of you. But you, all you do is revert back to where you come from. And all you can talk about is how much you learn. You ain't learned if you can't apply it. We got to be able to walk with God. And let him deal with us where we are so can we, be, we can be made better. Not for ourselves, but for those that need to know Jesus in the pardon of their sins. Again, we love you. Thank God for you. And I don't go nowhere without reminding myself that I am who I am because of y'all.